you've presumably caught wind of the Exxon Valdez spill of 1989, also the Deepwater Horizon spill that crushed the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Yet, did you catch wind of the oil rig off the bank of Louisiana that toppled during Hurricane Ivan in 2004? Starting in 2018, it was proceeding to release 700 barrels of oil into the sea consistently, taking steps to surpass Deepwater Horizon as the locale's most exceedingly terrible spill. It's as yet spilling today. Yet, the oil and gas industry isn't simply hurting the earth. It's likewise reassuring continuous debasement and the irregularity of riches and influence far and wide. This is particularly the situation in Russia, where that country has put the entirety of its chips on gas and oil being the nation's essential wellsprings of riches and influence. In spite of these alarming issues, the industry keeps on creating billions of dollars, and in pursuing that cash and new wellsprings of gas and oil, it is acquiring its notoriety for being the world's most dangerous industry. Chapter 1 Oil extraction got moving in the late 1800s in the United States, with John D. Rockefeller transforming it into an industry. Everything began a Pennsylvania ranch in 1859. Two men, Edwin Laurentian Drake and his employed associate Uncle Billy Smith, figured out how to penetrate an opening and power a cast iron funnel 69 and a half feet into the ground. What rose was classified rock oil, and it prompted an industry that has gotten one of the most prevailing forces on the planet. That day, Drake and Smith got around 20 barrels of oil out of the ground. Quick forward to 2019 and over 90 million barrels are being created every day. How could we get from that point to here? All things considered, the man who truly transformed the business into the one we know today was John D. Rockefeller the originator of Standard Oil and the person who composed the book on the best way to work a savagely fruitful oil business. In his initial 20 years of business, Rockefeller put the press on and purchased out any contender that crossed his way. By 1875, he possessed each significant petroleum treatment facility in the United States. Other men were developing imposing business models as well, similar to those that Andrew Carnegie and Philip Armour made in, individually the steel and meat enterprises. None demonstrated as worthwhile at oil, however, Rockefeller was getting a lot of money that taking care of the government officials who controlled the business added up to simply one more operational expense. Assessments propose that, at his pinnacle, Rockefeller merited what might be compared to $305 billion of every $2,006. In 1911, a milestone antitrust claim prompted the Supreme Court seeing Rockefeller and his organization as blameworthy of making an imposing business model through outlying strategic approaches. Be that as it may, the decision just figured out how to partition Standard Oil into a lot of littler organizations, every one of despite everything them claimed by Rockefeller. Therefore, he had the option to keep storing up his fortune and wound up more extravagant than at any other time. Rockefeller likewise left the oil business with an inheritance of ensuring no penny went unpinched. He kept a nearby tally of each bit of stock that was purchased and ensured that nothing went unaccounted for or unused. As the years went on, this emphasis on continuing working expenses as low as conceivable would keep on being the business as usual of the oil business. Chapter 2 at the point when U.S. oil supplies evaporated in the late 1960s, the Vitality business went to gaseous petrol, which it attempted to remove through rather flawed methods. Did you realize that the U.S. government gave atomic bombs to oil organizations with an end goal to keep modest Vitality streaming? It occurred in the late 1960s and mid-1970s when local oil supplies were waning and expenses were on the ascent. Worried about keeping a relentless inventory of minimal effort vitality coming, oil organizations began to look toward gaseous petrol. The way toward extricating and catching gas caught under profound layers of strong stone requires the making of gaps, breaks in the stone that enable the gas to leak out. This gave the procedure the name that it would come to be known by fracking. As indicated by the U.S. Bureau of Mines, the Rocky Mountains held an expected 317 trillion cubic feet of gaseous petrol, enough to fuel the nation for quite a long time. The Austral Oil Company was at that point working diligently attempting to tap the gas underneath land they possessed in Rollison Field, Colorado, yet their endeavors had so far demonstrated ineffective. 
that is the point at which the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC, stepped in. Since World War II the nation had been developing a sizable assortment of atomic weapons, and a program known as Project Plowshare was investigating quiet methods for utilizing these nuclear bombs. Why not collaborate with Austral Oil and go through a nuke to release such valuable gas? Doubtlessly it could be more proficient than lumbering drills and derricks, isn't that so? On September 10, 1969, Project Rollison started with a 40 kiloton atomic bomb exploded 8,426 feet subterranean, abandoning a natural hollow 300 feet high and 152 feet wide. The uplifting news was that the impact invigorated the likeness around 10 years of creation from an expectedly animated well in the Rollison field, as indicated by the Ventures Manager's report. In any case, the awful news was that it left the gas somewhat radioactive, containing krypton-85 and tritium, and they couldn't make certain of precisely how much tritium since they didn't have the best possible gadget to gauge it. Throughout the following three years, two additional tests with much increasingly incredible bombs pursued. Be that as it may, atomic fracking never demonstrated monetarily suitable. The bombs were muddled, excessively expensive, and insufficient gas was being caught. Truth be told, all through the 1970s, 1980s, and mid-1990s, nobody had the option to think of a financially feasible strategy to get at that profound underground gas. In any case, at that point, in the late 1990s, a man named George Mitchell at long last popped that nut. Chapter 3, Fracking Got Prudent in the Late 1990s, However, There Have Been Well-Being Concerns the oil and gas industry had pretty much abandoned fracking by the late 1990s. Arriving at the shale developments, that profound sedimentary stone that ensured the flammable gas, was simple enough. Be that as it may, breaking it and maintaining it open in control to let enough gas out was demonstrating slippery. Numerous U.S. oil and gas organizations were rather concentrating their endeavors on verifying remote oil rights. Be that as it may, at that point George Mitchell, author of Mitchell Energy and Development Corporation, which in the end turned out to be a piece of Devon Energy, built up a sort of fracking liquid, which would get known as slick water. It was infused into brakes to keep them open, in a procedure that would turn out to be commonly known as water-powered fracking. It would reform the business. The careful substance of the fracking liquid would turn into an exceptionally insured competitive innovation. The conceivable divulgence of its fixings, and whether those fixings were spreading poisonous liquids around farmlands and drinking water supplies, wound up being a fervently discussed subject in government courts. The issue is, water-powered fracking includes the high-pressure arrival of as much as 1.2 million gallons of slick water at once. Regardless of whether that liquid was sheltered to drink, and nobody is guaranteeing it is, a ton of it winds up reappearing from the beginning having blended in with underground components that are regularly radioactive or noxious. Frackers endeavor to contain or discard this wastewater securely, yet it's normal for it to spill into the region encompassing a fracking site, close by occupants have seen their pets and animals bite the dust, and the individuals themselves have experienced indications of arsenic harming because poisonous wastewater got into pastures, freshwater springs, and drinking wells. Tests have indicated regions around fracking locales to contain synthetics, for example, ethanol, butanol, and propanol, all known to be slick water added substances. Nobody needs these passings and ailments to happen. No one needs the synthetics in fracking liquids to enter the circulatory system of a house pet or person. So the inquiry becomes what steps are being taken to guarantee this doesn't occur? As we'll find in the following squint, while the oil and gas industry is incredible at getting things out of the ground, selling them around the globe and profiting, it's not truly adept at tidying up after itself. Chapter 4, The Oil Business is Infamous for Neglecting to Forestall Mishaps and for Not Tidying Up the Natural Wrecks It Has Made. Regardless of whether you're not a news addict, you've most likely found out about the Deepwater Horizon mishap. In April 2010, a progression of unfortunate incidents on a seaward oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico prompted 11 laborers to disappear and assumed dead and almost 5 million barrels of oil being dumped into the ocean. The fiasco stood out enough to be noticed, yet it's a long way from a separated occasion. 
Under about 14 days after the Deepwater Horizon disaster, an ExxonMobil pipeline off the shoreline of Nigeria discharged 25,000 barrels of oil into the Niger Delta. In any case, that isn't uncommon either since a 2006 report demonstrated that 546 million gallons of oil have spilled into that equivalent delta in recent years. That is a normal of 11 million gallons of oil each year. ExxonMobil is no more peculiar to spills, having gotten the world's consideration in 1989 when its tanker, the Valdez, ran aground off the shore of Alaska, spilling about 11 million gallons of oil. So you may anticipate that the organization should have been solid and steady when the U.S. government approached it to help BP with its Deepwater Horizon spill. For sure, at this point, the organization had built up a 580-page plan on the best way to react to spills. In any case, as it turned out, none of those pages contained a viable strategy for containing the wreckage. Endeavors, for example, a regulation arch didn't work, and neither did putting a huge number of gallons of concoction dispersants into the sea. The oil business wouldn't uncover the elements of the dispersants BP and ExxonMobil were utilizing either, and besides not improving the situation, the substances made cleanup laborers feel sick after delayed introduction, disappointment over the business failure to authorize a helpful crisis reaction plan was voiced by Congressman Ed Markey who dressed down the leaders of the business in a congressional subcommittee meeting in June of 2010. Markey got ExxonMobil's CEO, Rex Tillerson, to concede that we are not well prepared to deal with, major spills. That is the reason the accentuation is consistently on keeping these things from happening. However, as the examination concerning Deepwater Horizon would demonstrate, the mishap was preventable. It was the after-effect of a terrible bond having been utilized to seal the well, lazy checking, and control of weight, and flawed reinforcement frameworks. Through and through, the individuals included were seen as blameworthy of compromising and endeavors to set aside time and cash. Chapter 5, Oklahoma is a case of the abusive and cash-hungry nature of the oil and gas industry. There are numerous instances of exactly how much the oil business esteems cash over the security and prosperity of individuals, however, one of the most distinctive models is in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is only one of the states that have encountered a blast in fracking tasks. All through the main decade of the 2000s, the land the nation over was getting purchased up left and right in lunacy for opening progressively gaseous petrol. Truth be told. Flammable gas was being advanced by the business as the incredible salvation, still modest, and much cleaner and to a lesser extent a risk to nature than oil. A few Oklahomans, as Chesapeake Energy's Aubrey McClendon and oil investor Harold Hamm, were making billions, but the state itself was entering a financial and general well-being emergency. McClendon was at the bleeding edge of the fracking blast and had amassed 30 million portions of Chesapeake stock which was going for $70 an offer in the late spring of 2008. In the interim, between the years 2008 and 2013, the state income from charges identified with oil and gas creation diminished from $1.14 billion to $529 million. During that time, instructors in Oklahoma would turn into the third least paid in the nation and numerous government-funded school locale moved to four-day weeks essentially because the state couldn't manage the cost of an entire five. The state's foundation started to lose the faith severely, with new schools so ineffectively constructed that they couldn't shield kids from the tornadoes that routinely threatened the state, seven kids even kicked the bucket in a 2013 tornado. However, even despite fighting families and instructors, oil and gas industry lobbyists would keep on battling to keep the state's creation charge rates down to 1 or 2 percent. Notwithstanding the way that penetrating was consistently occurring in states with charge paces of 10 or 12 percent, industry pioneers were cautioning that even a solitary rate rise would drive business out of Oklahoma. Furthermore, science was uncovering that fracking caused tremors, some so solid that they surpassed 5.0 on the Richter scale. Be that as it may, notwithstanding the continuous harm to homes in Oklahoma and developing worry among occupants there, news that the quakes were not characteristic was being denied and even stifled by the business. 
the incredible Oklahoma oil big shot Harold Ham ventured to such an extreme as to tell a dignitary at the University of Oklahoma that he'd prefer to see the researchers exploring the seismic tremors be expelled. Chapter 6 the ExxonMobil company has an alarming history of looking the other way when it manages to generate governments. Alongside utilizing its campaigning influence to keep its assessment rate as low as could reasonably be expected, regardless of whether that duty cash is urgently required, the oil business tends to work with some fairly obscure political players around the globe. Take the degenerate administration of Equatorial Guinea, for instance. The nation has one of the most noteworthy per capita livelihoods on the planet, gaining a normal of $37,200 for each individual, a lot of that cash originates from managers ExxonMobil. However 77% of the populace in the nation live in destitution, and somewhere in the range of 1990 and 2007, when the measure of oil income went up from $2.1 million to $3.9 billion. The newborn child death rate figured out how to increment from 10 to 12 percent and clean water stayed rare for 57 percent of the populace. While the entirety of that oil cash doesn't appear to make it to the individuals of Equatorial Guinea, it is unquestionably making it to the nation's leader forever, Teodoro Obiong Nuema Mbasogo, and his showy, spinned up beat child, Teodoro Nuema Obiong Mong. When Theodorin was winning a revealed $60,000 per year as the nation's pastor of horticulture and ranger service, he moved $75 million through U.S. banks, purchasing up an extravagance home in Malibu and a $38.5 million personal jet. Other spending binges included dropping over $1,700 on two wine glasses, leasing manors at $7,000 every night and spending a sum of $1,398,062 on Michael Jackson memorabilia. There have been continuous examinations concerning the legislature of President Obiong, who is positioned at number 8 on a Forbes rundown of wealthiest world pioneers. Also, some may ponder whether ExxonMobil's business relationship isn't supporting the horrible circumstance in the nation. However, the organization has gone on the record saying that it's not keen on how cash gets utilized once it's set under the control of somebody like President Obiong. As one ExxonMobil representative put it in 2005, IT is not our role to tell governments how to spend their money. What's additionally on record is that Equatorial Guinea speaks to 10% of Exxon's worldwide oil supply, and the country has the locale's most industry accommodating expense and benefit sharing approaches as per the International Monetary Fund. So it's not hard to comprehend why Exxon is in no rush to cause trouble in its commonly advantageous association with President Obiong. Chapter 7, The Russian Government Has Been Savage in Controlling Its Oil Assets Maybe considerably more alarming than ExxonMobil's dealings in Equatorial Guinea has been its association with a different universe pioneer who keeps unlimited oversight over his nation's oil supply. Russia's Vladimir Putin. The tale of how Russia's oil supply stopped under the thumb of the Kremlin is a long one. Get the job done it to state that since the fall of the USSR, different business people have attempted to dispatch their oil organizations. In any case, the effective ones have wound up being compelled to offer two organizations claimed and worked by the Kremlin. Today, the greatest of those organizations is Gazprom which controls Russia's gaseous petrol industry just as certain media and TV organizations, and Rosneft, which runs the country's tremendous oil supplies. The issue is that these are not well-run associations, totally degenerate and utilized by Putin as dull apparatuses of political power, the two organizations drain cash. Studies propose that Gazprom loses around $40 billion per year because of debasement and squander and the U.S. State Department has described the organization as wasteful, politically determined and degenerate. Or as James Grant, the originator of Grant's interest rate observer, puts it, Gazprom is the most noticeably terrible oversaw organization on the planet. All things considered, Russia is an essential wellspring of oil and gaseous petrol in and around Europe, and Putin has been merciless in exploiting this. Gazprom, specifically, has been a useful asset in Russia's forceful relations with Ukraine, particularly once the last country started to eye the plausibility of entering the European Union. In 2006, Russia shut off its gas supply to Ukraine, 
driving Ukraine to redirect a bit of the gas that was traveling through its nation from Russia to different spots like Hungary, Austria, and Slovakia for its utilization. Russia at that point blamed Ukraine and said that this reaction was an indication that Ukraine would make a questionable accomplice in the European Union. This was a strategic maneuver against Ukraine as well as a ploy to scrounge up help for the new Nord Stream pipeline that had been worked between the European Union and Russia, bypassing Ukraine by and large, since Russia has placed the entirety of its eggs in the oil and gas industry container, this is the main muscle it can flex. With no homegrown challenge, and with cash relentlessly spilling out because of defilement, Russia's oil and gas industry has not put appropriately in innovative work for new advancements or elective energies. This likewise implies Putin needs outside help for any critical undertakings, such as attempting to bore in the Arctic. Luckily for Putin, ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson is glad to work together while posing not many inquiries. Chapter 8 Russia's dependence on oil assets for its status as a force to be reckoned with has had extensive outcomes. Rex Tillerson was attempting to land an oil manage Iraqi Kurds that would be worth billions of dollars in 2013 and 2014. The arrangement would guarantee that benefits were sent directly to Kurdish-run banks and not to the focal Iraqi government. The Obama organization made direct requests for ExxonMobil to step away from the arrangement as it would undermine endeavors being made to construct a serene alliance among the country's Sunni, Shia and Kurd populaces. As a 2017 New Yorker article brought up, making an autonomous income hotspot for the Kurds would just decline the cracks inside Iraq. In any case, Tillerson proceeded with the arrangement. All things considered, there was nothing unequivocally unlawful about it, so for what reason would it be a good idea for it to be not the same as some other arrangement? A comparative situation introduced itself in the organization among Tillerson and Putin, a relationship that came about in Tillerson being granted the Russian Federation's Order of Friendship in 2013. The two men needed to begin penetrating in the Arctic at the earliest opportunity. For this situation, Putin had the penetrating rights and the best icebreaking ocean vessels on the planet, while ExxonMobil had the boring innovation and ability to take care of business. Confounding issues was the way that Putin had been piling on sanctions in 2014 because of Russia's illicit addition of Ukraine's Crimea, just as the way that the continuous clash brought about a Malaysia Airlines stream being shot down over Ukraine, executing more than 200 individuals. So on September 12, 2014, the U.S. government educated ExxonMobil that, because of approvals against Russia, the organization was currently lawfully required to stop its joint activities with the state-controlled Russian oil organization Rosneft. At last, ExxonMobil was conceded two weeks to gather its packs and shut things down securely. ExxonMobil and Rosneft kept boring, and on September 27, 2014, Rosneft declared they'd struck oil 7,000 feet beneath the Kara Sea, simply squeaking in under the 14-day window. While Russia's dealings with Ukraine may have prompted sanctions, they additionally prompted rebellious new online strategies. In 2013, the Internet Research Agency, situated in St. Petersburg, Russia, started creating methods for utilizing the web and web-based life to spread seeds of disturbance around the globe. Representatives worked in shifts, 24 hours per day, to make counterfeit web-based life accounts as a feature of online crusades, for example, supporting Ukraine's master Russian separatists and spreading lies about the expert EU side of the contention. What's more, maybe most broadly, supporting Donald Trump's 2016 U.S. presidential offer. The Russian operators of the Internet Research Agency were likewise huge supporters of Rex Tillerson getting named as U.S. Secretary of State. Chapter 9 the bipartisan endeavors in the United States to keep Russian authorizes set up is an indication of expectation, however, more advances should be taken. Contentions have been made that Russian help for Donald Trump's crusade was because of Putin's incredible aversion to Hillary Clinton. However, an increasingly convincing contention can be made to recommend that it was about oil. Russia needs worldwide assistance in continuing and extending its oil industry and the Ukraine sanctions have made getting that help amazingly troublesome. That is the reason Russian agents met with the Trump battle in that scandalous June 2016 gathering at Trump Tower. The inquiry was, 
Would Trump support lifting the ascents whenever chosen? All things considered, the pending arrangement to manufacture a Trump Tower in Moscow was likewise stuck in limbo given those problematic authorizations. As it turned out, one of President Trump's most punctual acts in office was an endeavor to get the authorizations lifted. Luckily, the U.S. government filled in as planned and hindered those endeavors. When the Senate found the Trump Organization's aims, Republican Senator John McCain and Democratic Senator Ben Cardin coordinated an extremely quick reaction, pushing through enactment that arranged the approvals and made them unmistakably increasingly hard for Trump to dispose of. Both Trump and Secretary of State Tillerson griped and pushed back against the enactment, yet clearing endorsement, the vote was 98 to 2 in the Senate and 419 to 3 in the House, implied that Trump had no real option except to sign it. This case of majority rules system in real life can be viewed as an encouraging sign, since it demonstrates that it's conceivable to hinder an industry that, whenever left to its very own gadgets, will keep on causing defilement and geopolitical irregularity and toxic substance the planet. In any case, more guidelines should be passed. A genuine case of such a guideline, that nearly happened is U.S. Cooperation in the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, or 80, a global exertion planned for considering the oil and gas industry responsible for where its cash originates from and goes to. U.S. eagerness to join the activity pursued an alarming bipartisan Senate report called the Petroleum and Poverty Paradox, assessing U.S. and international community efforts to fight the resource curse. But from the get-go in his administration, Trump immediately hauled the United States out of the 80, to the consternation of the individuals who were seeking after increasingly corporate obligation. There is a plenitude of proof to show how the oil and gas industry is assuming a tremendous job in causing geopolitical and ecological decimation. It's the ideal opportunity for this generally rewarding of ventures to start to pay for what it's finished. Blowout, corrupted democracy, rogue state Russia, and the richest, most destructive industry on earth by Rachel Maddow Book Review. The oil and gas industry keeps on hurting nature through its carelessness concerning lethal oil slicks. It additionally keeps on empowering the geopolitical unevenness on the planet through business manages to generate governments, for example, Russia and Equatorial Guinea. For the sake of more cash and more prominent supplies of gas and oil, the industry has persistently acted in light of a legitimate concern for brisk benefits, regardless of the blowback.